हरे कृष्णा महाराज Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Maharaj Please accept my humble obeisances I would like to hand over call to you Maharaj Glorious is Shila Prabhupada Mm Oh glory is to Lord Balaram So uh can we put a verse up on the board Yes, Maharaj. Which verse, Maharaj? Um, Today is the Lord uh, Balram appearance to Prabhu Ji, Maharaj. What? Yeah. Which which is the verse, Maharaj? Uh, from Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, chapter five of Adi Lila, which is chapters entitled Nityananda Balram, and verse number ten. Om Gyanti Mirandasya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pasyatya Desa Tarine Vansha Kalpataru Vishya Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Vakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this is from chapter 10 I'm sorry verse number 10 of chapter 5 of Ali Lila about Lord Balaram I'll read the Sanskrit Srishtadika Seva Tanra Ajana Bala Shesha Rupakara Krishna Vivada Sevana Srishtya Dika Seva Tanra Ajana Balana Shesha Rupakare Krishnera Vidvada Sevana. He executes the orders of Lord Krishna in the work of creation. In the form of Lord Shesha, he serves Krishna in various ways. According to expert opinion, Balaram is the chief as the chief of the original quadruple forms is also the original Sankarsana. Balaram the first expansion of Krishna expands himself into five forms Maha Sankarsana Karna Desai Garbhadaka Sai Shirodak Sai Shesha These five plenary portions are responsible for both the spiritual and material cosmic manifestations in these five forms Lord Balaram assists Lord Krishna in his activities The first four of these forms are responsible for the cosmic manifestation where Shesha is responsible for personal service of the Lord. Shesha is called Ananta or unlimited because he assists the personality of Godhead in his unlimited expansions by performing an unlimited varieties of services. Sri Balaram is a servitor Godhead who serves Lord Krishna in all affairs of existence and knowledge. Lord Nityananda, who is the same servitor Godhead Balaram, 
performs the same service to Lord Lauranga by constant association. Okay, we can continue. We read the purport, and here in the purport, it mentions that there are five manifestations of Lord Balaram who plays different roles. I, yes. But uh, I would like to just take you back a little bit into the unfolding of the spiritual personalities. We learned that Krishna is the original supreme Adi Purusham, the original supreme personality wherein all manifestations of the Godhead come from him, and such as Balaram and all of the incarnations, the Vishnu incarnations, the Narayan incarnations. And uh, from Balaram comes Chaturvyuha, which is Aniruddha, Pradyumna, Vasudeva, and Sankarsana. And then from that, and that unfolds into the next manifestation of the Godhead, which is Sri Narayan. And from Narayan comes the second chapter, Vyuha. And from the second Shankarshan of the second chapter, Vyuha, then uh, Mahavishnu comes. And then that begins the uh, unfolding of the material energy. So Lord Balaram's role in relationship to all this is that he manifests his energy as the supreme, as the spiritual world itself. Lord Balaram is the, is the, the spiritual world is an extension of Lord Balaram or manifestation of his energy. And all the Vaikuntha planets in the spiritual world are also manifestations of the energy of Lord Balaram. Balaram's role, as mentioned here, he is the servitor Godhead. He assists Lord Krishna in all affairs. So when we read, we also understand that there are different relationships with the Supreme Personality of Godhead between the Jiva, us, and Krishna himself. And they take the form of five manifestations, which are called rasas. The word rasa really means mellow or mood of mood of relationship. And there are five. One is neutrality, second is servitorship, the third is friendship, the fourth is parental affection, and the fifth is conjugal love. Lord Ralaram is so eager to serve Krishna that he manifests himself in each of these five categories to serve the Lord accordingly. So we all have familiar, especially for those who have us who have deities at home. We have um, the deities have their dress, their clothes. Their clothes is an extension of Balaram. Their bed, if we have a bed for the deities, and that is also Lord Balaram. If if the deities have an umbrella, that umbrella is Lord Balaram. The shoes of the Lord are also. Lord Balaram. The arty paraphernalia by which we worship the Lord, that is also Lord Balaram. And some, but not all of the jewelry that is used in the worship of the Lord is also considered to be an expansion of Lord Balaram. And finally, within that same category of what's called neutral servitorship, the Murdanga is also an incarnation of Lord Balaram. So he serves the Lord, although he is the Lord, to assist the Lord in the Lord's services throughout both spiritual and material worlds, as it says here, both in the material affairs. And he does it by existence and knowledge. Now, we'll get out of the technical and get more into the more simple understanding, but I think it's important that we understand these technical aspects because they lay the foundation to understand Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, which is the essence of our spiritual development or our spiritual practice, you might say. And so as servitor, he serves the Lord in different ways, as friends, he associates with Krishna as his brother in Sri Vrindavan Dham, and they play various pastimes with their associates, the cowherd boys. 
and parental affection, he is the older brother of the Lord, and he watches over the Lord when the Lord goes to perform his activities in Vrindavan. Not all of the activities, but many, especially in their pastimes as cowherd boys. And in the Madhurya Ras, it's quite confidential and very somewhat esoteric. He takes the form of Radharani's younger sister, whose name is Man Ananga Manjari, and he serves the Lord in that mood. And so you see, Balram is not only the Supreme Godhead, but he is the servitor Godhead. And he is the manifestation of all of the um, gurus. In other words, he is Guru Tattva. When we practice Krishna consciousness, we are meant to take shelter of a spiritual master. And that spiritual master is a representative of Nityananda Balaram, which is the original spiritual master. So we get the mercy of the Lord in the form of the Lord's intimate associate known as the spiritual master, who is an energy of Lord Balaram. And so he plays that role also. He plays many roles. Now, many of us are familiar with Balaram and his leelas with Krishna as he appears in this particular world. We know that when Krishna was, before Krishna was uh, actually appeared on the earth, it was destined that he was going to take birth in the womb of Devaki and be the eighth child of Devaki. At that time, one very powerful demon named Kamsa was very much harassing everyone around him in order for him to have complete rule And uh, his sister was Devaki. And one day as he was driving the chariot on the wedding day of his sister, he heard a voice from the sky saying, the eighth son of your sister will be the cause of your death. He immediately tried to kill his sister, but Vasudeva, the wife of Devaki, prevented him to do so with logic, reason, and argument. And eventually, it plays out where he promised to give every the, all the child that were born of Devaki to Kamsa. And so the first six children were killed by Kamsa. Now the seventh was actually a plenary expansion of Lord Balaram, who appeared in the womb of Devaki. When he was there in the womb, Sri Krishna himself contacted his internal energy known as Yogamaya and said to Yogamaya, you have a service to do. You have to move Lord Balaram from the womb of Devaki into the womb of Rohini, who is living in Vrindavan with Mother Yasoda. Now Rohini was also pregnant at the time. And so Yogamaya, knowing it was a very difficult service to perform, but the Lord wanted it. And so the Lord empowered Yogamaya to accept it, and she did. And then it appears that uh, Devaki had a miscarriage, and so did Rohini. And, but the womb of uh, Rohini was protected, and Balaram was transformed or transferred. And of course, Balaram took birth in Vrindavan, not in the jail, so Sarawal in the Torah. So it goes, it goes on to explain how the Lord appears in this world in different manifestations of himself. The, Lord, the word Balarama, Bala means strength, and Rama means one who takes pleasure in using great strength. His strength, of course, is powerful. He is the all powerful supreme personality of God. There's no limit to his strength. But he uses his strength only 
for the benefit of others and not like people who have strength, they may use it just to uh, express their strength to others where they get some, you know, aggrandizement, some recognition. Balaram is not like that. He is also called Sankarshana because uh, there are two families that were together that were the Vishnis and the Gurus. So he united, united, I'm sorry, he united these two families into one family and therefore he's called Sankarshana. And he is also known as uh, Balabhadra, it's another name from the Lord. Of course, Balaram has many names. These are the prominent names. Now, he assisted Krishna in his pastimes in so many ways. The most prominent that we hear of is when they were playing in Vrindavan as cowherd boys. First, we have to understand that, just to give a greater depth of this discussion, we have to understand that Lord Nityananda and Lord Balaram are the same person. They're not two different people. Uh, the, there's a beautiful banjan sung by Srila Naratam Das Thakur, in which he sings, Burjendra, Rajendra Nandana, yea, Sachi Sutta Hoilo Se, Balaram Hoilo Nitai. That same Krishna Vrindavan has reappeared in Navadvip as Goranga Mahaprabhu, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the same Balaram has reappeared as Sri Nityananda. So Balaram and Nityananda are not two different people. They are this exact same manifestation of the Godhead, but they appear in different forms. The Lord has unlimited forms, and therefore Balaram and Nityananda are two of those forms. So it's important to understand that Lord Nityananda and Lord Balaram are not two separate persons. One who thinks like that is highly criticized by Shastra, saying that they are no better than an atheist. Um, we hear, hear wonderful pastimes. We pray to Lord Balaram, of course. Prabhupada said we should pray to Lord Balaram in order to give us spiritual strength. Not material strength, but spiritual strength, which is superior to material strength. Because one who has spiritual strength means that they can overcome the difficulties of material energy and stay connected to the Lord in devotion. Therefore, they're on the spiritual platform. They are not under the platform of duality. Material world means duality. Wherever there's something, there is the opposite of that. But on the spiritual world, there's no duality. And for Balaram's strength, there's no counter. And Pala Krishna, and when Prabhupada established uh, the Krishna Balaram temple in Vrindavan, he could have called it the Ravisham Sundar temple because the Radha Krishna deities there are <laughs> but he called it the Krishna Balaram temple, knowing that Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan were mostly centered around his activities with the gopis and especially the cowherd boys. There's many nice stories. Uh, Balaram was not in favor of the battle of Kurukshetra. He had some affection for Duryodhana, although Duryodhana was not a very nice person, to use the word, he was somewhat evil. But he took shelter of Balaram and learned the art of club fighting from Sri Balaram. Balaram spent many, many, many months and even years training Duryodhana and how to fight with a club. So there is one part in this particular Leela where Balaram is not happy 
that the war is going on. And towards the end, he decided to leave. When he was leaving, he noticed there was two persons engaged in combat, and that was Diodana and his, which was his disciple, and Bhima, the Panda, Pandava Bhima. And they were fighting. Balaram wanted to mediate the dispute, and he requested them to stop fighting. And he based his request on, well, Bhima, you know, you're very strong. You have the strength of 10,000 elephants. And, but Duryodhana, he is very expert in fighting with the club. So the fight will go on and on and on. No one will win. But they didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear that, and they rejected Balaram's request, and Balaram left. And then he went traveling, and he went to different places. One place he came was to Kurukshetra, where the sages of Nami Saranya were holding a wonderful meeting to elect a presiding guru over the entire assembly. After much debate and considerations, the leaders decided to choose uh, Ramaharshan Sutta. Now he was just installed as the presiding guru over this very essential meeting, which was about establishing religious principles for the age of Kali. Of course, you see, Bhagavatam starts off with the sages of Nami Sarai and discussing. But you'll find that when Balaram was traveling, he came to this place of Kurukshetra, not Kurukshetra, but um, Nami Sharanya. Nami Sharanya. And as uh, soon as he came, as soon as he walked in, all of the sages and saints, they were tens and thousands of them, they all immediately rose to their feet in honor of Balaram and glorifying him in so many ways. Balaram was very pleased by the reception, but one thing was out of line. Ramaharshan Sutta, who was sitting on the Vyasa who was now the newly elected person, didn't even acknowledged the presence of Balaram. He didn't get up from his seat. He made no request. He no, made no statements at all. Balaram noted his impudence and decided to teach him a lesson. So Balaram picked up a piece of grass, which we know as kusa grass. Kusa grass grows in India, and it's a kind of grass that is very sharp. So he picked up a piece blade of Kusa grass and came at uh, Ramaharshan Sutta and he hit him with the Kusa grass which immediately killed him. And now the Lord was thinking what to do. He didn't want to disturb the rest so he um, he didn't say anything actually it was the sages that started to complain. They said to Balaram, you know, we've just elected him as our presiding guru, and now you have killed him. They were somewhat questioning Balaram's activities. Balaram said, oh, all right. If you like, I can bring him back to life. They said, no, 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 we don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. And then Balaram suggested that uh, his son, whose name was Sutta Goswami, because you read that in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first canto, Sutta Goswami, the son of Ramaharshan Sutta became the presiding deity, the presiding guru. Now it's an interesting thing. Why did Balaram kill him? What was his fault? He failed to recognize the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And even if he did recognize, he failed to honor the Lord. Um, this is the basis of human life, is to glorify the Lord, to serve the Lord, to honor the Lord in different ways. Omaharan Sutta has been given, was given 
a, such a high position as presiding over this great assembly of very, very elevated personalities. So it's expected that he was also spiritually elevated. But Balaram explained later that his, uh, his spiritual development was uh, more like an actor who performs a dramatic performance as a show for others. And in other words, Ramahar Sutta didn't have the qualifications to sit on the high seat because he didn't honor the Supreme Personality of Godhead when the Lord came. So we see, although he had great knowledge, and that was, there was no doubt, his knowledge was theoretical. Theoretical at best. Why? Because he failed to honor the Supreme Lord when the Lord personally started to come. And so um, it's explained that uh, if one, ha one understands their relationship with the Supreme Lord and acts in that relationship, then they have all knowledge of all Vedic scriptures. Yes, Deva Prada Bhaktira, Vita Devi Tata Guru, Pasyaita Pratite Karta Pratisanakta Mahatmanaha. One who has implicit faith in both the Lord and the spiritual master, all the imports of all Vedic knowledge are automatically revealed within the heart. So that was Balaram. He showed by example but to avoid. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, we can't hear you. Namaste, yeah. So this is Lord Balaram. There are many wonderful pastimes. Prabhupada would sometimes say to us, um, who's more stronger, Krishna or Balaram? And then the devotees would answer in different ways. And those who answered Krishna, Prabhupada would say, why do you say Krishna? And they would say, well, because in Vrindavan, you see the deities of Krishna Balaram on the altar, and Lord Balaram is leaning on the shoulder of Krishna. And Prabhupada said, yes, that is the reason. That's the indication of the reason. The reason is Krishna is the supreme power of all power. Oh, there's many, many wonderful pastimes of Lord Balaram. He assists Krishna in different ways. He killed the demon Palambasura. He killed the demon Dainakasura. When Dainakasura was employed by Kamsa to live in the Taliban forest and to manage the uh, forest by keeping away everyone. Danuk was a ass. He was a demon in the form of an ass. And anyone who would come there, they would be attacked. And so, one time, the cowherd boys said to Krishna, Krishna, there's so many nice, tasty, juicy fruits in the Taliban forest. They're way high up in the tree. And we would like to taste these fruits, but there is one demon who's always harassing everyone who comes. His name is Danuk. Can you get the fruits for us? Krishna wants to give pleasure to his devotees. So both the him and Balaram, they're on their way to Taliban Forest. When they get there, Balaram immediately starts to engage in tasting the fruits. He starts shaking the tree, some of the fruits fall, he picks them up and 
he's, he's tasting these nice fruits and uh, he's not paying attention to anything else. Danuk, the head of the all, the ass, the ass demon clan, he became angry. He saw Balaram and then he decided to do something and he started to run towards Balaram at full speed. And when he got close to Balaram, he kicked him with his hind legs in the chest. Balaram didn't even didn't even bat an eye. He was completely unaffected by the demon. And then the demon came back again, the second time, running even faster and with greater speed, he kicked the Lord. But when the Lord tried, he tried to kick this time, the Lord grabbed him by his feet and he was locked into two different verses. And that's described in the uh, Krishna book and also in Srimad Bhagavatam. So what happens is that uh, Danuk, after he, he, he comes the second time to grab Lord Balaram, Balaram grabs his hind legs and twirls him around at a rapid speed. While he's twir twirling him around, the demon lost his life. And Balaram threw him up in the tree. When he hit the tree, all the fruits fell to the ground. And the cowherd boys, along with Krishna, had so many nice fruits. And that was one of the pastimes. So Danuk, he represents, although he's a demon, factual demon, he represents working hard for material gain. Uh, that which is considered to be something that the devotees can not get, get involved with working hard simply for keeping the material gain on the table. And then of course Krishna joined in and both Krishna and Balaram were somehow fighting these demons and one after another. Then finally after Danuk was killed, he was thrown up in the tree and then all these other ass demons came and charged at Krishna and Bala and they were just grabbing him and throwing him up in the tree and all the trees were full, all the fruits were falling all over the ground. Cowherd boys were just picking him up and they had so much wonderful fruit. And then uh, Prabhupada describes that the demons were different color asses. So the site looked very, very panoramic, as Prabhupada said. So, so when the Lord kills a living entity, the living entity is benefited. And that he's elevated to the position of liberation and he returns ultimately to the outer regions of the spiritual world. Okay, so this is an interesting pastime. So these are a few of the things on today's uh, honoring of Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram, he loves Varuni beverage, which is a kind of honey liquor that comes from a, the sap of a particular type of tree. And uh, he enjoys that. Well, Lord Balaram has his own set of gopis. Krishna has his set, Balaram has his set. Because Balaram's gopis are a little bit younger when he came to Vrindavan for two months during the month of Chaitra, which is the April, uh, March, April time of the year, he stayed there and performed Rasa dance with his devotees. While he was there, he enjoyed in so many different ways. And it's explained that um, he wanted to go down to the banks of the Jamuna to bathe. But he called Mother Jamuna to bring the river. And she, seeing the personality, she didn't recognize who he was. And she refused to respond. Balaram became a little angry, took out his plowshare, which is his personal, one of his two personal weapons. The other one is his club. And started to cut his personality into smaller sections. And then uh, Jamuna realized, oh, this is the Supreme Lord. She came and she with folded hands, she apologized. 
And to this day, the Jamuna has many tribulates, smaller streams coming off. This was all due to the activities of Lord Balaram. So on this day, we can really go deep into the mood of devotion because Balaram is the guru that teaches us pure devotional service. And throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam, especially and particularly in the 10th canto, we find so many information. Balaram, like Krishna, also plays the flute. There's one verse in the Bhagavatam that describes him and Krishna both playing the flute as they're going into the forest of Sri Vrindavan. Okay, so we'll stop there and see if there's any questions or comments. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for such a beautiful, beautiful class. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Uh, it's, uh, now we can ask the questions or realizations. Please go ahead, dear devotees. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Koti Koti Dandat Panana, Anand Koti Dandat Panam, Shishi Krishna Balram Jainti Ki Jai, Shila Prabhupada Salagudev Ki Jai, Shishi Radha Patanam Ki Jai. Thank you Maharaj, Anand Koti Dandat Panam for your association. Hare Krishna. Komadaki, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, this is Gail. Hare Krishna. Yeah, um, a couple of things. One is, I, I missed your definition of Sankarshan. You were saying something about he who unites. You know, he unites the two families that were there. The Kurus and the Rishnis. The Rishni family and the Kuru family were united by Balaram because of his relationship to both families. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, the other thing was, um, you caught my attention when you said that there is, there are, no duality in the spiritual world, like no opposites. But then we yeah. do we do see that they you know they do have things like night and day and you know um, you know everything is not the same you know same there. So how do we understand that there is no duality? There isn't the duality is material because material is relative. Relative means something in a relationship. When you see the different manifestations of the spiritual world and you see various apparent opulates, they're all part of the same one spiritual substance. They don't, there is no, here duality means opposite. So night and day is there to facilitate pastimes, that's all. But over here, you know, when we see night and day, right, everything is, the material nature. So in that sense, it seems like there is a oneness here also, you know, of oh, the because, you know, night and day are opposite effects, but there in the spiritual world, it's all transcendental. It's all chintamani. It's all pure spiritual rasa. So the dualities that we experience here are more or less one is better than the other. But in the spiritual world, there's no betterment or there's no in relationship to everything is of the absolute nature. Krishna goes to sleep even in the spiritual world, but he wakes up. And it's not that, you know, he is under the influence of the duality, the apparent duality. These are just manifestations for the sake of pastime. That's all. They're all the one spiritual substance. It's hard to understand from a theoretical or philosophical point of view. 
Well, you have to understand the difference between material and spiritual. The difference between material and spiritual is spiritual is absolute. There is no dualities. That means there's no inebriates. There's no deficiencies. Whereas in the material world, something is better than something else in the relative sense of you. So we say good and bad. So we like good and we don't, we uh, avoid the bad. But even good is, is, from another perspective, is also bad. So the definitions that we apply to the relative material world are simply our own understanding. But everything is as it is. In the spiritual world, everything is perfect. Chintamani. It's all, chin, I mean, it's all spiritual ras. It's all spiritual substance. Duality means material. Spiritual is no duality. Mm -hmm. So... I guess you can say that duality, um, you know, as you were saying, duality means that something is better than something it's, else. It's in relationship to something else. But in the spiritual world, nothing's in relationship. Everything is of the same absolute spiritual energy. It's nothing in relationship to everything is 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 in the oneness of the spiritual substance. That's all. And the differences you see are simply for the sake of pastimes. That's all. Mm -hmm. It's like when, when someone asked Prabhupada, is there so, snow in the spiritual world? Prabhupada said, yes, but it's not cold. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and related. Cold is, is, is something that causes difficulty. There's no difficulties in the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Or you can, you can probably say that um, in relationship, you know, means that in relationship to our sense gratification, right? Yeah, but there's no sense gratification there. Everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. Right. But everyone is enjoying also as they serve Krishna for Krishna's pleasure. Okay. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, it's hard to understand what, if you try to figure it out using material concepts, you'll stay in the material understanding. You have to accept the definitions based on the Shastras and understand that spiritual is all good and elevating, illuminating, not relative, and material is all the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, man. It's hard to understand because unless we realize it through our devotional service, it remains on a theoretical platform and we can't really get a clear understanding. Yeah, it's not possible. It's it's a chintya. A chintya means inconceivable. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Anybody have any questions? Hare Krishna Radha Mataji, there is one question in the chat. Would you like to read that? Yes, Mataji. Did you find it, Mataji? Yeah. How Paldam Devji helps in taking off Anarthas? That is the question, Prabhuji. Speak, speak it, say, it, say it again, please. How Balram Dev Ji helps in taking off Anarthas? How does Balram Jayanti help in taking off our Anarthas? Yes, Prabhu Ji. Oh, there's special mercy on this day. And if you follow the principles 
of worship on this day, automatically you purify your consciousness. You get you get added mercy in the activities you perform on this day because they are in honor of Lord Balaram during his appearance. So it happens automatically. Spiritual elevation comes automatically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, if you try to perceive it in a material way, you won't be able to. Sometimes you can understand if you're, you're feeling more happy or you're feeling more inspired for service. These are all indications that mercy is flowing. More mercy is available. Hare Krishna, Chandramali, Swami Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, was, <laughs> it's so good to see you. Um, I was just wondering, um, what is the best way for us to honor this day and honor Lord Balaram? By, by uh, hearing about his pastimes and speaking his pastimes. Read him from, bring some devotees together, read from the books about Krishna book. We have so many stories of Balaram and Krishna. From Chaitanya Charitamrita, from Srimad Bhagavatam. These are the best ways to honor the Lord. And then also we do Abhishek on this day. Those who have deities of Krishna Balaram, you can perform the Abhishek and invite others to take part and organize it accordingly. Abhishek is one of the most important features of worshiping the Lord on this particular day. And uh, yeah, hearing about, chanting about Abhishek, glorifying the Lord. Uh, I think one of the most important principles that we should adopt is that we shouldn't be just trying to do a little bit in the morning. The rest of the day just goes on as the, the normal day that we always do. Nothing changes. No, we want to dedicate the whole day to Balaram. The whole day. And then create a series of activities which take up the whole day's time. Chanting, dancing, hearing, Abhishek, devotees cooking feasts, cook a big feast for Lord Balaram. Offer honey. Devotees offer honey on this day as part of the offerings. Balaram likes honey. So, yeah, if we just just go ahead and do everything, like, okay, we have a class in the morning, that's so nice, and the rest of the day, what do we do? We forget about Bala. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's not the idea. It should be the whole day. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare you. Is that all right? <laughs> Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And you'll see, oh, wow, this is so nice. It's a festival day. It's not just a day of, you know, speaking a few nice words about that. It's actually a festival. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, I had a uh, thank you very much for the beautiful class. I had a question about um, how Lord Balaram is different from the Supreme Lord because sometimes he is also considered as uh, as the Lord. So and he is sometimes he is also considered as assisting the Lord. So yeah, he's, he's he's the supreme personality of Godhead, the absolute truth in full. But he plays the role when he comes to the material world to assist Krishna as Balaram and Lord Chaitanya as Lord Nityananda. He assists his, you know, his brother. He comes as a form of a brother to assist him in his pastimes. So he takes the role of the servant, 
but he's always the Lord. He's a, he is the supreme personality of Godhead. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, no difference. It says that the difference between Krishna and Balaram is the difference between the, the colors. Krishna is, is compared to a blackish rain cloud during the monsoon season. And uh, Balaram is considered to be like a spring, white spring cloud during the spring season. So that's the only difference between Krishna and Balaram is their color. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, can I follow up on um, what you said earlier just now that um, you're emphasizing the importance of Abhishek. So I was wondering why that emphasis on Abhishek. It's just traditional that we bathe the Lord on this particular day. It's his birthday. So when he, he becomes on his birthday, he gets a bath, <laughs> a special bath. When, he, when he's in Vrindavan, his mother keeps him home on that day and she bathes him with all nice substances. So that's, that's part of the, the honoring of the personality is to offer a sacred bath with nice substances. Pancha, pancha Gavya, or Pancha Amrita, or juices, various types. We did one here we're in the midst of a festival here, and the devotees, we have about 50 devotees here. No, actually, we have about 80 devotees here. So we had this morning, we, we took Krishna Balaram deities, and we did an Abhishek here. And everyone was singing and dancing and uh, uh, observing the Lord as he took his bath. So that's, that's part of worshiping the Lord. It's a wonderful part. We do that on all of the occasions. We do that. We do that with Krishna and Radharani on Radharani's birthday. We do it with Krishna and Radharani on Krishna's birthday. Uh, we do it at with Gornitai on each of their uh, birthdays or their appearances in the world. It's a wonderful, one of the most wonderful ways to to honor and serve the Lord is the Abhishek ceremony. Okay, actually, there was um, just one last question I forgot to ask earlier about that first purport that um, we put on the screen that said that, you know, the five forms of Balram are responsible for the spiritual and material manifestations. So normally, we hear that is the three Purusha avatars that are responsible for the material manifestation. Correct. Mm -hmm. so, so is it that um, the ones that, the one that is responsible for the spiritual manifestation is Mahasankarshan or? No, it's Shesha. Is, okay, so Shesha is the only form of Balaram that's responsible for the spiritual manifestation. And in his original form is Balaram also, mm -hmm. who's known as Sankarshana, who's part of the chapter of Vyuha. Yeah, he's also, Shesha is the multi-headed serpent on the, on the bottom of the universes that hold up all the universes on his head. The spiritual universes also? No, uh, well, the spiritual universes and the planets in those spiritual universes are expansions of Lord Balaram. That's mentioned also, but not in that particular purport. What you see in the purport is the manifestations of the material expansions of the, the Supreme Lord, which are facilitated by Lord Balaram. You have to understand that everything material and spiritual is an energy of Balaram. Everything. Because it said the five forms of Balaram are responsible for the spiritual and material manifestations. Mm -hmm. So, 
Sankarshan is one of them. Or Maha Sankarshan. Mm -hmm. So Maha Sankarshan is responsible again for the spiritual. Yeah, he, the he, he manifests himself as the spiritual world, as the spiritual planets, as the spiritual universes. The Vishnu forms that appear in the spiritual form world and Narayan forms that appear in the spiritual world are all expansions of Lord Balaram. But specifically his Maha Sankarshan form. Maha Sankarshan, yeah. But Maha Vishnu form is the, man of the first manifestation of the material element of service by Lord Balaram. Which and she... Uh, that which unfolds the material universes, yeah. And and Shesh, his Shesha form is is supporting the material manifestation, not the spiritual. Well, he's also chanting the glories of the Lord while he's doing that. He constantly chants the glories of the Lord. Okay. Okay, thank don't, you. Yeah, don't try to make a, a you know a complete division between the two because they overlap. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, these things are not so understandable by our intellect. Only when we become uh self-realize will these under these things be understood through realization and not through intellectual uh manipulation these things are way beyond our our capacity to understand that's the nature of the spiritual world if you could explain it materially then it would be something ordinary but it's not It's like Prabhupada used to say, Krishna can take day and turn it into night, and he can take night and turn it into day. So what does that mean? So you can guess what it means, but it doesn't mean that's you that doesn't mean that's correct. But Krishna is so powerful, he can do that. Make day into night and night into day. So when we, all of these different ways of explaining the opulences of the Lord are just for us to appreciate the greatness of the Lord. But to understand these things, you have to be on that level. <laughs> it comes by self-realization. So is it better to then you know, not ask about those things? Just accept that this is the reality, that's all. That's why Jiva Goswami says, unless you accept achintya, you cannot understand the absolute truth. Achintya means it's inconceivable. He's beyond the range of our mind, senses, intelligence, and even imagination. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I know everyone, but nobody knows me. <laughs> Even the greatest of the great. Only those who are fully self-realized as Krishna reveals within their heart and minds the truth of his existence. So it's a revelation. That's called intuitive knowledge. Intuitive knowledge is spiritual knowledge. It's a revelation. It's not simply an intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. So we get, we talk about it, and we describe it, and we try to frame it within a philosophical context just for the sake of getting a little understanding of the opulence of the Lord. But to fully understand it is not possible. Like, uh, for instance, one time, one very intellectual group 
of philosophers who came to see Prabhupada in, uh, in England. And they were called the Mensa Society, Mensa. And their whole program was to take difficult philosophical teachings and try to understand them through discussion. So Prabhupada was with them and he was talking about the, the greatness of the Lord, the inconceivable greatness of the Lord. So one of them said to Srila Prabhupada, um, can Krishna create a rock he can't lift? Can Krishna create a rock he can't lift? So if you say yes, you limit his uh, lifting power. And if you say no, you limit his creating power. So Prabhupada answered it because it's a trick question. It doesn't have any meaning. It's really a trick question. But Prabhupada said something interesting in response. He said, yes, Krishna can create a rock he can't lift, and then he'll lift it. So what it means is don't try to, you know, try to intellectualize the nature of the absolute truth. Understand, you can only understand him through devotional service. Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. Only by devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. So the Lord remains a mystery to all of us, but he reveals truth about himself when we engage in devotional service more and more. He gives us a little understanding. That's the greatness of God. If God wasn't great, and then we and then we could easily understand him and we we put him on the same level we we were on. And he becomes like us, or maybe a little greater, that's all. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. If anybody have any. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, there is one question in the chat. Dear Maharaj, do you honor an Ekadasi feast or a normal feast on Balram's appearance day? A normal feast at lunch. It's a half a day fast. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. If no one has any further... Yes, Mataji. <laughs> if no one have any further questions, we can end the call here. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for enlightening us today. We are very grateful to you and we look forward to your association again in the future. Let's pay our obeisance to Maharaj. Holiness, Chandra Swami Maharaj ki. Jai. 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 Jai.